Welcome to episode seven of Raiders of the Lost Art, the math and magician system for guitar. Raiders of the Lost Art is a live stream series dedicated to the lost art of active listening and high depth audio. It's a series dedicated to showcasing interesting and creative approaches to the composition of music, to new and innovative technologies, and to highlighting those breaking new ground and helping elevate the experience that music provides. Learning any instrument is hard. It takes dedication, practice, and skill. One of the challenges that most guitarists face when picking up a guitar is the constant battle with memorizing the seemingly endless patterns of chords, scales, and arpeggios. What if there was an easier way? Something right before us that we have not seen or applied before. Something that can break through the complexity with a simple change to a fundamental part of the guitar. This video aims to bring you that change. A system for guitar that uses the power of symmetry and the magic of mathematics, Mathemagician. Does this to help reduce the information required to be a competent soloist by at least 66% over traditional methods? This system is super simple to learn and it dramatically helps open up the guitar fingerboard so as to make it easy to visualize chords, scales, arpeggios. It's an approach that allows the player to solo over changes and open up the player to harmonic freedom. It's a system where the requirement of learning patterns over six strings is reduced to two strings. A system that requires the player to know, know only a small amount of info in order to play virtually anything anywhere on the fingerboard. Now, there are some core requirements to get the best out of this system. However, a beginner can easily gain proficiency as they develop. So with that, let's get started. So let's start with the concept of zones. The first thing to understand about this system is that it requires the guitar to be tuned differently. Why? In order to create symmetry. And you'll see how that works in a minute. But look, touch dial instruments like the war guitar, the Chapman stick, have been using this concept for years. And since starting to learn touch dial myself, I've really realized the importance of mapping this back to the guitar. And hence, what I've done is, is create uh, a system whereby I'm synthesizing my knowledge and my new knowledge into one process. So a zone is a collection of two strings and there are five strip zones in total, but we're gonna start with three. Zone one is these two strings, the E and A. Next zone is the A and D strings, that's zone two. And zone three is, you'll soon find out, the C and F strings. So any pattern on this system that's played in any zone is mirrored to the other zones via a simple position shift in the pattern. So each pattern is a mirror of the other pattern. Um, you'll notice the same pattern occurring in each zone is separated by an octave, but it's also by just a couple of frets. And so regardless of any pattern, any scale, any arpeggio, any chord, the exact same pattern is repeated in each zone. The benefit of the guitar being broken into three mirrored zones is the player only needs to learn scales, note names, intervals, arpeggios, chords in one zone on two strings. In simplistic terms, this reduces the amount of learning required um, so you can have a competency over the fingerboard by about 66% because it's a third of what you would normally do. You'll instantly see the value in this modular approach, one where every lick, arpeggio, phrase, scale, tapping sequence is easily transported and joined across the fingerboard. Most importantly, it helps the player focus on small blocks of two strings. And these blocks contain an entire musical ecosystem, blocks that house almost every chord, scale, and arpeggio, as I mentioned. But hang in there, right? So this will all make sense, I promise. Bottom line is this system makes learning the guitar easier it helps demystify the modes. It helps make you play over chord tones, uh, it help, which helps make you play over changes easily. And it helps with fretboard visualization. Let's talk about the notes on the E and A strings. So let's move on. So everyone should pretty much know what the notes on the E, are, e or A strings. Well, it's important though, because this lays the foundational knowledge for learning on the first zone, right? 
Knowing where these notes are is incredibly important, but you should know them by now from playing your bar chords. A good exercise that I used to teach my students is to get a phone and a voice recorder and every three seconds call out a different note in a musical scale, including sharps and flats. Keep the intervals large. So for example, A, C sharp, F. And so you go on and on and on for three minutes, then play it back. The good thing is you're gonna be listening to the recording and you've gotta figure out where it is. And what I would do is play that, the first, when it you hear the note, play it on one string, on the E string, then find it on the A string and try and do it before it actually spits out the next note name. So it's a great exercise to get yourself to make sure you do really know all the sharps and flats. So we know what chords are, right? It's the vertical alignment um, or arrangement of notes from a scale. So the study of chords is called harmony and harmony is concerned with how one or more notes interact with each other. But for the sake of this, let's define chord theory as a recipe, uh, a recipe that one uses to find the notes in the chord. Now, there are so many lessons on this available. Uh, if you need help with this, go to Google and type in chord construction and you'll find something that will help you. For this system to work effectively though, you should understand the bare minimum, the following examples, major, one, three, five, minor, one, three, flat, five, major, seven, one, three, five, natural, seven, so on, so on, so on. Uh, dominant, augmented, half diminished. You should know what those formulas are. You should just have them down and be able to spit them out. Uh, obviously, the numbers one, three, five relate to the first note, third note, fifth note of a major scale. And when you see one, three, flat, five, seven, flat in a minor seven, it just means get a major scale, flatten the three, and flatten the seven. It's not, there's, no, there's nothing super technical about this, right? Um, look, all your advanced players, I know you get this, right? But just bear with me because this, this, this becomes a lot, it, it just, it'll, it'll make sense. So why is this important? Well, it's important to know this because we're not gonna think about modes in this system. We're only gonna think about chord tones and how chords are constructed and what scales suit what chords, not uh, Lydian dominant to Phrygian to uh, Superlocrian. We're just gonna be thinking about the actual notes in the chords and using a block, how to quickly modify that or how to actually visualize what the chords look like in scales. So, we know what a major scale looks like, but now we're in a new tuning, perfect fourths. So let's have a look at this six note major scale and fill in the blank later. So only six notes, not all seven. In A, can you see it? The first six notes are in zone one. The second six notes are in zone two and the six next, next six notes are in zone three. There we have perfect symmetry. The, it goes like this across the fingerboard, okay? So this pattern is exactly the same as in here and is in here. And the patterns are just shifted uh, on octave on that sort of second, that uh, major second degree there. But the mirroring comes into place. You start to see it as a mirror. Whatever I'm playing here, whatever scale it is, whatever, whatever, it's then gets copied over to here and over to here. And this mirroring allows you to um, not only look at the major scale and the mirroring of this, it allows you to uh, look at these zones and think about zones and what are the little blocks that go into the zone. Does that make sense? I hope so. So this system is based on mirrored patterns and, and symmetry by using this tuning. So we use two different structures now. This is the important funky bit that I've sort of come to come up with. And this helps us understand the, the building blocks of this system. One is called the block and the other one is called the chain. Essentially, it's the world's first blockchain for guitar. The block is a group of six notes spread across two strings with three notes per string. The six notes in a block represent the first six notes of even any given scale or mode. And in the diagram in the handout, you'll notice you know, how I've actually put this together. Um, if it was the notes of a minor scale, we would obviously just flatten the third and the six, but that would still be in the block, that would six notes. Any scale, any mode, as I mentioned before, Lydian dominant, right? We're obviously not using the dominant, but we would be using the sharp four. So it would be a major scale, we're just sharpening the four. And so what we start to think about is we start to think of these blocks and the blocks are housed with a, z a zone and the zones are two strings. A block is two string. A block is six notes that sit within a respective zone. Each zone can be mirrored across the fingerboard. Have a look at the handout. It's got it all in there. Now, imagine how easy it is to take a six note scale pattern on the E string and A string and then move that pattern around the fingerboard at the exact same interval across different zones. That's the essence of the system. Anything you can play in one block is mirrored across three zones. I hope that's making sense. It's become simple, right? We're not thinking about this third degree here and oh, I've got to change all my fingers. Now let's talk about the chain. 
The chain has a single function, is to connect the blocks. So the chain links the mirrored blocks together. The chain is always a single note, and there are only two different chains, either a major seven or a dominant seven chain. The chain gets its position from the seventh note of the associated scale. So if it's a dominant seven, it's a flat, obviously. If it's a major seven, it's natural. So in the diagram and the handouts, you'll see how we then take our six note major scale and turn it into a fully functional major scale by using the chain. But let's look at how the chains work. We've got our six notes, then we've got our chain, which is our seven, which then slides up to the next six notes, which chain slides up and we get this perfect, we, we start to see the symmetry happening across here. Let's call it a blockchain architecture for music for now. But we, once you start thinking blocks and chains, chains are very simple. It's a dominant or a major. When you're thinking of a chord, you think it's a major seven or a dominant seven, that will tell you what chain to use. And then you start sliding between these things and you can get all around the neck on your arpeggios. It's really that easy. Now, when you start to solo over changes, all one has to do is think of the notes in the chord of the block, right? So if it's a, a minor or it's a, you know, a, a, a flat nine, a flat 13, you just know exactly what notes in that block to alter. It becomes very, very easy. Once, once you do this, um, I just encourage you to start thinking, go and get the fanciest chords you can. Some of them you won't be able to do because part of it will be the chain, but the rest of it you'll be able to do. Just think six notes in a block. Blocks create the symmetry the chain joins it. It becomes a way of life and a really way to start flowing all across the fingerboard and moving between these zones. Now, there are two other zones, zones four and five. Now those zones, instead of covering the E, A, D, G, and C and F strings, they cover the strings, the, the connection between the strings between. So it's the A and D strings are in zone four and the G and C strings are in zone five. Same thing, so if we're playing a a pattern on these two strings, it gets replicated over here. So it has the same visualization concept, the same mirroring concept. Okay, let's talk intervals. Knowing the patterns is one thing, but also knowing the, the intervals is super critical. Um, and it allows us to be able to sort of understand how to build chords, how to build arpeggios, how to build scales. With fourth tuning, the pattern between the intervals remain the same across the fingerboard. So we only have really have to learn one set of patterns for intervals and they are movable across the fingerboard. For example, wherever you are, a fifth is directly below the whatever note that is from a fifth. A third is one step back on string above. You, you start to see these intervals and you can actually start to then construct and know wherever you are on the board, exactly where you need to go and what you need to shift to get the color of the chord out. Um, now, when you move from chord to chord, when you're playing over uh, chord changes, all you need to do simply is to start thinking about the notes in, the, in the, the, the block that you're using and where the next chord is and what notes are in its block and which note then moves this, the least amount. There is a document in the handout. You can print out the, um, the, the diagram relating to this and you will see how you, you can start mapping this and you can start to see these notes and you can start putting it together. But quite simply, um, you know, if, we, if we got, uh, we're on an A major, and we know our E is our fifth, and then we're going to, let's say we're moving to an E minor, we, we, we know we're already on the E, well, then we know where our flat third is and our five is, we actually start to look at that as in block four, and this is in block one. It becomes a really easy way to start moving your key centers without going crazy on, on thinking, oh, I've got to go from this mode to this mode, and this is in this key center. It's very simple, it's in a, it's in a block. Now chords. A lot of people will go, the first thing they'll do, how can I play rhythm now? I have a C and an F on the top strings, so my open strings aren't gonna work properly. Well, they will. It's just that you might have to do some things a bit different. It's very simple. You just put a bit of dampening material here uh, between the first fret, um, between the first fret and the nut, just on the E and B strings. And if, if you want, hit me up and I'll show you where to get that. I've got a bunch of it I can even send to you. The other way is to put a capo um, on, on the first four strings, and then you're playing up here, but your chords are shifted up one, and then it will work. The um, point is when you put the dampening material, you still play all your chords, but there are a group of new chord shapes and triads that just really relate to the strings that you've that changed, but uh, they also connect across the board. And you only need to understand three shapes, three different triads. It's really that simple. And these three triads that you will learn um, just mirror themselves across the board. And once you know them, then as you're playing A, 
it becomes really, really easy to start thinking about. So you can still play your chords, you can still uh, comp them out, you can do whatever you want. So without symmetry, um, lots of records, uh, chords are required to play across these different intervals. Without symmetry, the player needs to learn scale patterns and modes that cover all six strings. Without symmetry, the player needs to visualize complex six string patterns. Without symmetry, the player cannot easily visualize the transportation of these scales. Um, or modes or arpeggios to suit different chords as they occur without shifting distances across frets or having an incredible knowledge of the um, of the notes on the board. With symmetry and perfect fourths tuning, there are a lot less chord patterns to remember. Remember three and your existing bar chords and stuff. The player needs to learn scale patterns and modes that cover only two strings. The player needs to visualize simple two string patterns. The player can easily visualize the transportation of these scales. They can easily see the transportation modes, arpeggios, to suit different chords as they occur without shifting distances across frets. Sounds like a no-brainer, right? So, so by now, most of us have heard of the term blockchain, a technology that is used in fintech that drives, that, you know, that has data in it, and the chain is the linking data, and each block is identical. X, Y, Z, the guitar blockchain concept is the same. A block holds data, e.g. a six-note scale pattern, uh, a three note arpeggio, whatever it holds, it holds something of the, a combination of those six notes. And the blocks, blocks are connected via a chain and each block is the same pattern, so uh, containing the same note, so it's just mirrored. So on the guitar, um, the chain is typically played using the same finger which is slid in place to form the first note of the following block. As I showed before on a major scale, there it is and it goes into it. So basically the major seven slides in. If I had a minor seven, it would slide in. If I'm doing a minor seven arpeggio, it slides up the same shape. So on, so on, so on. So that's the block and chain. And what it does is, trust me, it will blow your mind on your visual visualization. Uh, you'll be able to see these things really, really simple. Um, it will allow you to explore things. You'll be able to play, rather than thinking all these modes and trying to remember all these modes and then figuring out where it goes, you're just thinking about two strings and what, what connector connects them. Um, what I strongly recommend you do is get a song that you know, um, put on a backing track or something like that, and then just start staying on two strings. Limit yourself. Do not play more than six strings. And start to think about how you can play within a area of block, a, 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 an area where the block isn't changing much, and think about the notes in this block. It becomes so simple to start to see the notes that exist in the chord or that relate to the chord and where they're going to, and it starts to give you a really good understanding of harmony um, about how to play over these changes and sketches start, your ears start hearing it and you start visualizing, oh, okay, if I'm moving between a two, five, one here or a one, six, two, five or any, any type progression of a diatonic sort of key center, it just becomes simple because you've actually identified the map, the transitory map between the notes of where it changes. So you can start playing these things in your improvisation, which are really, really, really simple. Um, it sounds like a lot, but guys, you're here, you're at the end of the hero's journey. You are the hero for taking up this challenge and trying something different. Um, you're more than a hero, you are a raider of the lost art. The lost art being the lost art of creativity, of exploring something completely new. Um, it takes courage to try something. Uh, and whilst, you look, I know it's different, I would not have put this in front of you if I didn't think it would be valuable. Um, this isn't about me, it's about me trying to provide something back that's unique, as in my typical fashion, that provides value to the rest of the world. So. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out with an example of me on my war guitar. All I'm going to be doing, just to imagine that the, 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 the melody strings, or the six strings, the ones at the bottom on my war guitar, are tuned in exactly the same sort of concept. It is the symmetry across it. So when, as I play what I'm playing, even though I've only been playing a year, you should be able to see the symmetry of my right hand playing and how I'm moving between these progressions. I'm going to leave it with you. Hope you enjoy this lesson. Share any comments. Go for it. I look forward to connecting more and sharing with you more.
Okie dokie. Um, let's hope that that sort of makes sense. Um, um, magic of television here. Um, so, look, there's a lot of stuff going on here. I know it might have blown your mind. What I do encourage you to do is to get the handout. Um, when you first hear something, it can be a little bit overwhelming, but this really, really is, once you get around this, it's so simple. Um, you know, I remember learning all my modes and thinking, how am I gonna remember all these and where they go? So um, this becomes uh, like a little crossword puzzle. It, it, it start, as you, before you even change the cause, you already know where you're gonna go and it becomes this intuitive thing and it just demystifies all this stuff for you. So I'm gonna open it up to some questions. Um, so Jim, Jim's, uh, let me put you on the screen here, your question so everyone can see it. Um, Jim's asked, um, did the idea of perfect force stem from your war? And yes, it did. Um, you know, I've spent a year now just learning this instrument right at the beginning of my journey with it, but it is so amazing, these touch dial instruments and the stick is the same. So both of them actually use this fourth tuning. And look, the war guitar has a lot of different sort of setups that you can do. Some use nine strings on one side and six on another. My new war likely will be uncrossed, which means it'll have four bass strings on the bottom and four on the top. But yes, this parallel force idea came directly from um, learning touch dial. And I started thinking about that going, when I first got my head around it, it was like when I first got my seven string, it was like, oh, what's this seven string? I don't get it. But I persisted with it and I pushed through that uncomfortable zone and then bang, it just opened up. And on my seven string, I ended up tuning the low B to a low A but, and that made sense to me. But at first, learning the touch dial was, it was so weird because the tuning's all different. But once I got my head around it, I'm like, why isn't the guitar like this? This is crazy. And why hasn't anyone taught this? And I guess it's because people who learn stick and war guitar, there's not that many of them. And those people don't go back to guitar because they're learning a stick and a war guitar, which has infinitely got more possibilities. Um, so the other great thing is if you want to get into touch style guitar, which anyone who's a competent guitarist, I can tell you it's the most fun journey ever once once you've gone from guitar that's that's obviously where i'm going it is such an amazing sort of experience being able to play piano parts and bass lines and learning funk things and it's so cool but if you learn this on guitar you pick up a war guitar or a stick you've already got your right hand down it's just a, then so you, you're actually prepping your journey if you ever wanted to get into touch style but it, look, it's it's um, it's absolutely something that I, I believe strongly in. You know, um, to be totally honest with you, if I started again on guitar, I'd be the, for the small inconvenience about some open chords. I would be uh, I'd be using my VG99 and setting up some patches, or I'd be working out a way around it because the benefits for a soloist are so amazing and so easy. It demystifies us so much that even to be totally honest with you, right? Let's say that you try this and you go, I poo poo it, I'm going back to my normal tuning. You've just mapped in your own mind, broken the, the, the cult of the guitar lessons, which is I've got to learn all my modes and uh, you know all, my diatonic modes of my major, my diatonic modes of my minor, and it all sounds so confusing and then I've got to go over these chords. You've, you've poo pooed that, you've learned a new method, which is even on your E and A and D and G strings, it's the, they're the same, they're not changing. So this concept still works across the bottom four strings. And so you've actually started to learn to be able to solo the chord tones, which to be totally honest, is the important thing anyway. Um, that's what makes solos sound great, um, is to be able to sort of understand harmonically where the song is going, being able to read the road signs before they come, know where you are positionally, and by trying to think of a big scale pattern, like a six note scale pattern, and putting a fancy name to it, rather than, here's the chord that's coming up, here's the chord degrees, the notes are one, two, three, four, I've already got those notes right near me, I'm just gonna move that one note, bang. That's playing over changes. Rather than thinking, I remember when I first learned, I was like playing over changes, okay, A minor, I've gotta go Aeolian, and then I've got, uh, I'm gonna do this, so I'm gonna to go to G major, I'm gonna use that as, a, as the, the fifth degree, so I'm gonna use mix, you know, it's all too confusing. But you can't do that live, you can't be thinking about making music, making it sonically move and mold with the direction, unless you spend months or a week sitting down with the chord charts and then planning out how you're gonna play between the modes. In my view, that's that's uh, this way is a lot better approach. Okay, let me just uh, go through some of the other questions here. Um, um, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Uh, Maddie Thompson, Matt, what have you got here, bud? 
Um, that was so interesting. It's a puzzle, all right. Very cool to think of it in terms of blocks and patterns. Yeah, man, like, makes sense, right? This concept of these little blocks and these linking patterns means you start sliding all over the place. I, I look at it a bit like um, snakes and ladders. Um, here's another analogy for you. The ladder is the six notes and the snake is the slide between it. And so as you start thinking about that and you, if, I'll tell you what, here's a really interesting exercise, me being weird and everything. Listen to a great guitar solo, anything that you love, and try and identify the snake and the ladder in it. And you'll find that it has these movements dynamically. If you close your eyes and listen to the solo, you'll see the run going up and then it's sliding down with a nice bit of melody, then back into a run. And it had, a good solo has this sort of elements of phrasing, dynamics, and runs. And it, it's a quite interesting way to look at the architecture of it. Um, let's see, uh, Tansel, hey buddy. Hey Fimba, I love your work. Um, how does one start their journey with the war guitar? Okay, phenomenal question. So, uh, it's an interesting question because uh, the war guitars, there's not that many and they're quite, they're, they are expensive. Um, uh, you could always, if you want to get started, you could always uh, come around. Uh, we could always try and organize an intro lesson. I'm certainly no expert. I take lessons with the best people in the world. Like, you know, I don't do things by half and they're available now on Zoom. So Jim Wright, Randy Strom, um, you know, there's a bunch of them, Mark Cork. Um, you know, it's, it's about trying to go onto our War Guitars Worldwide page. We have a Facebook group and we have the top players in the world on there. Next week, we've got our second uh, War Guitar Raiders of the Lost Ark um, uh, live stream. And on that live stream, I've got Randy Strom and Jim Wright. So two of the penultimate legends of the instrument. Jim Wright um, is my teacher. Uh, Randy, I've had some lessons off. Both of them are just incredible. Um, and so you can just keep listening in and tuning in on that. Personally, um, you know, there is uh, Stu Box um, is my buddy here in Australia. He has a box guitar. I think I've got one lying around here somewhere. Let me have a look. Okay, let me pull this up for you. Here it is. This is Stu's guitar here. Now, um, Stu's making them again uh, and they're reasonable priced. Um, so you can get into these and they're more like a guitar than a war guitar, but you can set them up with exactly the same tuning. So you can then transition across. So I'd recommend having a chat to Stu, Stu Box. If you need his details, just reach out to me and I can put you guys in contact. He's also on my Facebook friends group. Um, Stu's an awesome guy, a really great innovator. Um, so look, that's where I would go. Um, first, um, start playing around with it and then, you know, start thinking about a war guitar. But if you, anyone wants to talk about war guitar, hit me up afterwards. I'm sold on it. I love it. It sounds amazing. I've actually so much so I bought a second one. Um, they take about 10 months to build uh, and they're not cheap. Um, my one's fully spec'd, but it's, a, it's about, it's going to land in Australia about 10K. So it's, you know, you're talking at least a $5,000 investment to get a, a war guitar. To get a Chapman stick, um, again, they're, they're up there too, because of import duties. But Another comment for maybe next week when you can ask some of the masters of the instrument, but yeah, thanks for the question, Tansel. Um, okay, let's, what have we got here? Um, got any other questions here? Um, so what's Jim got here? Jim, uh, big change for me is the C and F, as I already use the three note per string, blah, blah, blah. Uh, sevens is a link to the next part, can't wait to give this a go. Exactly, right? So this whole technique is so simple. All I've done, instead of going into like crazy, you know, oh, let's go whole new methods in this and crazy new modes and new like sweeping techniques, all we're doing is going back to the beginning and fundamentally changing two things, two strings up a semitone, that's it. And, but it brings the guitar into a line. I look at it like the spine on someone that's a little bit out. You just go to a chiropractor and they put you back. To me, now that I'm playing this, I just go, oh, why isn't guitar like this? It actually doesn't make any sense to have it in the tuning that's currently in. Um, and that's coming from me, and I've spent 40 years playing guitar uh, and learning everything I can know about everything I can know about the guitar. Um, for me, the war guitar was just this natural extension because I actually, I just got bored with the guitar. You know, it's like, well, where can I go now? And I know I can keep learning, but it's that 80-20 rule. It's like, I can spend another two years learning a tiny little bit and get a tiny bit better, or I can just jump off into the deep end and go into a new, whole new journey. So um, yeah, it's the same. We just change two strings. So 
This is what I mean about it. if if you practice this and you go back to normal tuning, it doesn't matter. You still actually, one of the most important things if you just don't use this tuning, but you go through this process, is you're gonna think about modes, scales, arpeggios completely differently. You won't be thinking about six note per string scales, you'll be thinking about little blocks. Even if you map it back to a normal B and E string, which will help you solo much better over changes because your mind cannot process six note patterns at once, trying to figure out what string you're on, what note. I'm sure nearly every guitarist that's on this stream, if I said to you, now instead of just the E and A string, the notes that I, all, I, all you need to know for this is the E and A strings, because you can just see the mirroring. If I said to you, find me an, an F sharp on the G string, on the D string, on the A string, and you've got three seconds, most people struggle. They know the outside strings, but they just don't know, you know, the inside strings. And they know the top string because it's a mirror of the bottom string, and that's where they play all their chords. So patterns are super important and small is super important. So reductionist mindset, keep it simple. There's no need to make it complex. We've all got complex. You can go online and find 10,000 videos on guitar about chord theory and all this technical stuff. My, my thing to you is we're in 2021. Let's throw that stuff out. Let's think about a new way, a simpler way, a way that helps us make music, not get us buried in theory forever. At least that's that's the what I that's what I think. That's coming from someone who's been playing the guitar their whole life. Um, and hey, I could be wrong. Um, so Glenn, what have you got, bud? Um, so this will increase the player's ability to focus on their creative output instead of having to develop decipher mode combos. And I figure just add in another zone for seven string. Yeah, exactly. So where zone four and five are, um, just just it sits in and out, depending on the tuning that you've got, obviously. But yeah, it's it's just another zone. When you think of zones, um, like your question is exactly right. You, you start thinking of zones as these little blocks and the zones, when you start thinking of blocks, you're thinking about little things that just can be placed anywhere around the neck because of the same pattern, okay? Um, so yes, I believe it increases the player's ability to focus on their creative side, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of the songs on, on the code that you guys already know because you've already checked out the streams is, you know, I'll swap strings around on a guitar. Um, I'll tune to all sorts of really weird tuning, like my seven string tuning uh, for bag, the word baggage, B-A-G-G-A-G-E. A lot of people think I'm insane, but when you think in zones, the different tuning opens your creative side to be able to go, okay, all I need to do is work out a pattern on two strings and then work out how that mirrors across the neck. If you've got symmetry, it makes life so much easier. Has anyone um, who's on this stream seen these guitar books that say a thousand and one chords or for guitar or a thousand and one scales for guitar? You know, I used to think, wow, when I was learning, wow, a thousand and one chords. Now I think, what a load of crap. Like a thousand and one chords. Who's ever going to learn them and why would anyone want to, right? Um, unless you want to be the world's best um, replayer of a thousand and one chords. For me, guitar is about playing music and exploring new dimensions. And I get very frustrated when I play the same thing over and over again. So that being said, um, this is this system. Uh, I hope you've liked it. I think it's sort of pretty cool. I think it's unique, it might not be, but um, it's come from me learning this instrument as, as Jim pointed out, and then mapping it back to guitar with my own teaching methods that I've used for years at the Australian Institute of Music and all my private students. So. Um, I hope this adds value. Um, you know, I've pretty much sold on the wall guitar now. So even though I've got walls of guitars around here, you know, it's, uh, I don't play them that much at the moment. I'm sure I will one day. Um, but, you know, I'm on this new journey with the wall guitar. Um, anyway, guys, I, I, I really appreciate you checking in. Please get the handout. It's only going to be limited for one week. It is a beta. Um, uh, we're working with some people at the moment about thinking about how we might package this up as a, as a proper course at a later date. Um, please don't share it around, but keep it to yourself. This is my gift to you for checking out the live stream um, and it will disappear in a week's time. So if you want that handout and it's a really damn good handout, I think it's 19 pages with lots of diagrams. Hit me up if you don't already have it. I already had a bunch of people who have got the pre-release last night. All you have to do is be a subscriber to my uh, YouTube channel and, um, and send me your email address. On that note, um, I really appreciate all you guys spreading the word out here. Um, I'd love to get this lesson out to the greater community, to guitar forums, to so because I'm trying to build a bit of a following for Raiders. I, if if I don't get the uh, the, the viewers, I just won't keep doing it. But but you know what's happening so much on my my YouTube is exploding. I'm nearly at 2,000 viewers in five weeks. So 
if we can keep that momentum going, I'm going to keep looking for really cool guests to bring on um, and for cool new ideas. We've already got a pipeline starting to build of some great guests and some great things. If anyone has any ideas on what we can do um, for, you know, the, in brand with, with Raiders, which is showcasing new and innovative technologies, uh, new music styles, new composing ideas, anything to do with audio, hit me up because um, I'd love to connect with people and, and showcase what they're doing as well. It's about, uh, you know, my goal here is to try and help people move into new dimensions with uh, their composing, with their writing and with their listening. So with that, guys, thank you so much. It's been great. It's been emotional, as they say in Lockstock. Uh, next week, War Guitar Part 2, Jim Wright, Randy Strom, two of the most iconic legends of the touch style instrument. Check it out. Until then, I'll, uh, I'll catch you later.